You've seen the best. You've seen the worst. Now here's the rest of both worlds. I'm Gayfesh, and when I die, bury me in the Windows XP background. And I'm Ari, and my sensitivity factor is 4.4. And today we will be discussing the Star Trek The Next Generation episodes Skin of Evil and We'll Always Have Paris. So a couple days ago, uh, Star Trek uh, just announced uh, all of the uh, the release dates for new shows and new seasons this year. They did. Um I heard. And we're getting a bunch. So we're getting uh, Picard Season 2 starts on uh, March 3rd, and they actually just released a new trailer for that with uh, Whoopi Goldberg in it. Ooh. So, uh, yeah, so I'm glad that uh, her character's coming back. You haven't even met her yet. I haven't, but I do remember her existing. Right now, as we're recording, uh, Prodigy is airing new episodes, but then we'll be getting uh, Discovery's fourth season will come back February 10th, and then... From mid-season? For mid-season, and it looks like we're actually going to get an overlap of three weeks where, like, the last three episodes of Discovery air at the same time as the first three of Picard. And then Mm. we'll be getting Strange New Worlds May 5th, which is, like, a week before my birthday, so thank you. (laughs) May is always when the big stuff comes out. Like, Marvel knows it's my birthday, so they've always released Avengers movies around then. (laughs) They know. (laughs) Let's treat that guy. (laughs) And then we don't have dates on Lower Decks, but we're getting Lower Decks Season 3 sometime later in the year. And then we'll be getting more of Prodigy uh, later in 2022 as well. Well, it's a good time to be a Star Trek fan, huh? It is a great time to be a Star Trek fan. Um, Have you been watching any Prodigy? Any more of that? I haven't. I have watched the first one and I still, and I want to go back because I heard there's not only Janeway, but I hear there's Seven of Nine, yeah? Is that the person that I heard was on there? No, uh, Chakotay is on it. Oh, okay. And not just Chakotay, actually, there was an episode on the holodeck where they had one of the characters take the Kobayashi Maru test. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but they were able to pick their crew for the test and their crew was just characters from different star trek shows and most of them they use just like stock audio for them because a a lot of those characters the actors are dead or too old to reprise it but you'll be very glad to know gates mcfed and provided her own voice as dr crusher yay i am happy to hear that (laughs) um and honestly at this point with prodigy it used to be that like i would tell people if they want to get into star trek start with the next generation Prodigy is being set up as like the way to introduce new people to Star Trek. Does it explain the Prime Directive? It <laughs> does. I'm still not on par with the. I don't. I don't quite understand the Prime Directive yet. It literally has a Prime Directive focused episode. Yeah. Mm, okay. So no, I'm loving it. I, I I think it's great. Um, I'm looking forward to where it goes. It no longer feels like Rebels. It now feels fully like a Star Trek show. Good. Good. Yeah. I was worried it was going to lean too hard on that trying to be like Star Wars Rebels or. Clone Wars or whatever, you know. All right, let's uh, go ahead and get into the episode. All right, so today we're talking about Skin of Evil. It's the 23rd episode of the first season. It first aired April 25th, 1988. The teleplay was by Joseph Stefano and Hannah Louise Shearer. The story was by Joseph Stefano, and this episode was directed by Joseph Sc- L. Scanlon. And Tasha dies. That's the plot. <laughs> I mean, there's more, but Tasha dying is the plot I care about. I mean, so this is something you you figured out really early that I liked Tasha a lot. And so I think you were trying to let me down easy by telling me that she died, right? I think that's what happened, like, even before the podcast. I don't think I told you that she died, but you did know going into it that she was going to die. Someone said it to me early on when I first started watching TNG. I thought it was you, but it could be somebody else. Well, she's going to die, so it doesn't matter or something like that. And I was like, excuse you? You know, (laughs) so like before we get on tangenting about all my thoughts about Tasha and everything, I just want to take a minute and just so Tasha and them, there's this tar monster. (laughs) I'm trying to tell the plot. They go down to this planet and there's a tar monster that has like caused Deanna's shuttle to not get back to the Enterprise. Yeah. And then... Tasha is unceremoniously killed like 10 minutes into the episode. <laughs> yeah, like it literally just throws her with like a, like a, a psychic bitch slap and then she just dies. <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> and then the rest of the episode is them trying to convince the tar monster who is like clearly just like a serial killer or whatever trying to get him to let deanna and the rest of them go that's the plot before we tangent but really it's all just about tasha dying i mean that's what it was for me skin of evil was a weird episode though like if you just take it as a star trek episode it was weird didn't you think i had been trying to avoid telling you how she dies i, I wanted you to just mm-hmm. see it for yourself But, like, a week or two ago, you had just come across a meme Uh about it, and you Uh just texted me just a picture of of Tasha and Armis, and you're like, she gets killed by a tar monster? And I'm like, no, I I wanted it to be a surprise. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, It was because of that. (laughs) So there was a meme around Christmas time. Because some woman named Sharon posted a picture of a very overcooked, completely burnt pie to Marie Callender's Facebook page and said, thanks a lot, Marie Callender, you ruined Thanksgiving. <laughs> Where she had burned the pie. And so there's all these memes that came out of it. And one of them was that Tasha's pie was Armus and killed Tasha. Or I'm sorry, that Sharon's pie was Armus because it was pitch black and killed Tasha. and Um, i was like what (laughs) so sharon thanks a lot marie calendars (laughs) ruining star trek for me do you know what the black sludge was made out of no i don't (laughs) they used metamucil and printer's ink what (laughs) yeah (laughs) like like the the fiber stuff you mix into your drink yeah and and printer's ink and printer ink. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I want to go back in time and be a set designer on some of these programs. <laughs> well, I mean, the set was already designed. They just used the alien uh, set, uh, the alien planet yeah, set. Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, my notes say, Tosh is going to die in an original series set. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Man, I hated the tar monster, but... So there's a few things, I I enjoy laughing, but there's a few things that sometimes it's just like, I'm laughing so much, it hurts, and I have these moments occasionally, I can't get the laughter under control because something is so absurd. Like, one of the times it happened to me is because I was watching Dr. Strangelove, and um, there's the line, gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room. (laughs) And that irony, just like, I laughed for like 30 minutes solid. I think my husband thought I was gonna die. There's the time I came up with the the phrase chicken business, and I just thought it was hilarious, and anybody could look at me and say chicken business, and I wouldn't be able to believe. But when Tar Monster Man says... He starts talking and could all of a sudden the this black thing they're staring at on the ground can talk not only can it talk it makes a 400 year old pop culture reference what was the, what was was the reference the tin man he calls him tin, tin man. man right right <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was just like, I was choking on air because I couldn't breathe. I was laughing so hard because not only does the tar monster that kills Tasha a tar monster, <laughs> it knows 400 year old pop culture reference. Uh, actually, 500 year old at that point. Is it 500 at that point? Yeah. Yeah, because Wizard of Oz was written like turn of the century, wasn't it? And there was no other references to Wizard of Oz in the whole show i thought like maybe it was supposed to be an illusion so that it would be like a hint that this is like you know oz or something but no no it was just a random pop culture reference that didn't make any sense (laughs) i really hated armis i know i'm not supposed to like him but i hated him (laughs) you're you're supposed to hate him but he also just sucks somebody asked me if i could go back in time and write Tasha's death so that it would like actually mean something like w- what would I do and well that's there- the part that made me so mad I'm just gonna interrupt for a second I'll let you finish your yeah. story but like that's the part that made me so mad was like it had no purpose like I, I thought when I knew Tasha was coming up and I knew she was dying I was like oh she'll sacrifice herself to like save the Enterprise or something and no she just gets knocked across the room like a rag doll for no reason and then just dies Yep, she just dies. And it's not even at the end of the episode. If I could write it myself, I mean, this is minor spoilers, but I think you already know that Picard becomes a Borg at some point, right? I've seen the movies, so I oh, think yeah, it yeah. happens in a movie, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was mentioned in the movie. I think uh, th- that's the um, the best of both worlds, the two-parter. Oh, the one our show is named after. <laughs> yes, Someday I- I'm going to understand the name of our own show. <laughs> I think if 
Picard as Locutus had killed Tasha, that would have given like real stakes, mm-hmm. like like real personal stakes, because obviously he's like threatening the entire Starfleet as Locutus, but especially if it came at a personal cost to him and to the crew, like that would have been a more meaningful death for Tasha, I think. Yeah, there's a lot of things that would have been a more meaningful death than let's make her the red shirt the first 10 minutes into the episode. Yeah. <sighs> Unfortunate. Actually, uh, when I was watching Lost, I remember how they, uh, like, in the first season or so, they were just like, oh, well, anyone can die at any point. And so sometimes characters that you would like would just kind of get unceremoniously killed. Like, um, what was his name? The the guy who ended up on, um, was it the Vampire Diaries later? Oh, yes. Um, the sister and brother. Yeah, where he just, like, falls really far. Shannon and, just, and something. I don't remember his name, but, like, he yeah. just kind of died. And I was like, ah, that sucks. Boone. Boone was his name. Boone! That's yeah. it. <laughs> and, like, he just kind of unceremoniously got killed. And I think, like, I remember after that, they stopped killing the the characters that everyone liked. Um, Yeah, but a lot of the stuff on that show and the reason they killed off people was because they had to be kicked off. Like, um, I can't think of her name, but the the one girl that's in a lot of, like, like in Predators, do you know who I'm talking about? Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, Yeah, so supposedly she was killed off because she got a drunk driving ticket, I think it was her, on Hawaii, and you're not allowed to even be in on the island if you have that DUI or whatever. So she had to be written off the show, but this happened to, like, three or four of the actors during that time well i remember she well i think that it was, was the rumors at least at it, the time it was because it was michelle rodriguez's character and then it was the, uh, the the blonde girl who was flirting with hurley like she also died in that same thing and i Anna think she maria was maria or something like that the one that was in the mental institution yeah yeah i don't remember her character but i remember she got uh killed off at the same time and i think she was also she had like a drug issue and that's why they wrote her off as well yeah and, like i don't know there there are certain things that are realistic like yeah people do just die unceremoniously in real life that's Uh that's that's life but that doesn't make for good fiction and like uh fiction isn't supposed to just be like oh this is so realistic it's like no tell a good story come on tell a good story exactly and it says in my notes here do i even get a funeral and yes i do at the end but at first i was like are we even gonna acknowledge that she really died you know (laughs) And then when Deanna says, I felt her die, I was like, we all felt her die, Deanna. (laughs) I I actually, (laughs) I I felt like um, this was actually a pretty good Deanna episode. Um, I actually really did, too. I thought Deanna was great in this episode. And and Marina Sirtis agrees. She she thought uh, the work that she did in this episode and the material she was given was was a a strong point in the first season for her. Because she's just sitting there with her leg broken, just lying on the floor. But in that state, she's still able to prove like an intimidating force to Armas. Yeah. She was, um, and she was able to keep up with him, you know, um, you've watched Hannibal, right? Oh God, of course I've watched Hannibal. <clears throat> Hannibal's so good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we should do a podcast about Hannibal. I have so much to say about Hannibal. <laughs> I need to rewatch that show. Um, <laughs> I would so rewatch it. I've watched it like three times. Anyway, it reminded me of, uh, who, what is her name? She, the psychiatrist that's Will's psychiatrist, but also ends up having a relationship with Hannibal with the dark hair. And then she ends up with a cane later. Yeah, I don't remember her name. I can't remember her name. Anyway, I loved, it reminded me of that. And I loved her so much because she's formidable because of the way that she can, like, trap people with the way she talks to them and stuff. And in its own way, it kind of reminded me of her, like, being super strong. That Deanna was able to show that it's not just physical strongness, like, mental and emotional, like fortitude is also important in survival situations. Alana Bloom. What's her name? Alana Bloom. I was I wanted to say Ariana, and I knew it wasn't right. Okay, yes, perfect. I remember she was one of the characters that was a, a man in the book that they... Oh, was she? And Freddie Lowndes, the uh, I knew about Freddie, yeah. yeah. I didn't know about Alana, um, because Alana's one of my favorite characters. I really did feel like somebody had been watching a bunch of serial killer documentaries and was like, maybe just because I watch a lot of serial killer documentaries, but I was like, this really feels like someone was like... Let's make a character out of Ted Bundy and put him in a tar suit. You know, like, how could we mm-hmm. make someone as evil as possible? Like, the way he was tormenting Jordy with his visor, for example. Like, he was just evil to be evil. Evil piece of crap. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
That's not, and that's not really an interesting character. Like, I like characters that have motivation, and I guess his motivation is that he felt sad because he was abandoned. He's the forever alone tar monster, yes. But he was <laughs> abandoned because he was distilled evil. A, <laughs> like, piece like, of shit, yeah. He, he yeah. wasn't a piece of shit because he was sad. He was sad and alone because he they deliberately created a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, and then how about how about the end when they're like, we'll just say no one can ever go to that planet again. <laughs> like oh okay because that works we've seen you guys go back to planets you thought were completely uninhabited or whatever which by the way i've figured out after this episode uninhabited just means we don't know because <laughs> every time they say uninhabited it's not uninhabited for a half second when like the enterprise leaves they fire a photon torpedo down and i thought it was just like this guy from orbit but they were actually just scuttling the shuttle it didn't even hurt armis apparently oh <laughs> that's funny <laughs> My notes say, I'm fueled by unfocused rage and have abandonment issues to Armus. You ain't special. <laughs> <laughs> their phaser holder on their uniforms is so impractical. Like, the way that it, like, is right on their hip bone and, like, makes it jut out. Like, if they truly were making universal uniforms that would work for everyone, it would be an actual pocket that the phaser could fit into <laughs> the idea i think is that in, in any of the like the phaser or the tricorder or anything like that their um uniform is actually just made of a material that you can stick things to if you want to oh like velcro -y kind of thing kind of like that but like you know like a space age velcro and so they don't have that's why they don't have pockets because anything they need they can just stick on which is dumb. Pockets are useful. Can you see people walking around with my wallet, like, stuck to my arm and my yeah. phone stuck to my leg? Like, yeah, this is normal. I just walk around with stuff stuck to me all the time. Well, I mean, in the 24th century, you don't need a wallet because there's no money. That's true. But how are you going to show your COVID vaccination card? I think it was Marina Sirtis who, like, when she saw... Um, the uniforms for Star Trek Enterprise, she like got mad at them. She's like, oh, you guys get pockets on your spacesuits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would be mad, too. The clothing uh, is supposed to be adhesive. But uh, if you notice in the shot where Riker gets sucked into the sludge, they all, obviously they only got one take of that, because once you pull Jonathan Frakes into Metamucil Inc., uh, it's going to take all day for that to clean off. You can't you can't reshoot that. That is true. As he's going in, Jordy's phaser pops off of his uniform and falls into the sludge. Oh, does it? I didn't yeah. notice. And That's so funny. It's not addressed because like later he's just got it. And like if it was in Armus, I don't think Armus would let him take it. So um, it was just that was just a, a goof that they had to leave in because that was the only take that they got of Jonathan Frakes going into the tar. Speaking of goofs, Beverly has a green outfit at the end. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> Like her whole uniform is green, like forest green for one shot. And, and it's at the funeral. And then when it comes back to her again, she's in her normal blue. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was like that in the original show or if it was something that they just uh, missed when they were doing the remaster. Because it, yeah. it's obviously it's a color correction thing. Because I think even Wesley's sweater is a little off, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was weird, but it was just that one shot that she was green. And I'm just like, oh, that's weird. I mean, um, in... Uh, Deep Space Nine and Voyager, the science and uh, medical uniform colors are more of a turquoise than, than mm -hmm. a blue. And so, like, when uh, for a half second, I was just like, uh, have I been misremembering that was Beverly wearing a green shirt? No, nope, no, it was blue. That was just... I really liked that forest green look to it, too. I thought it was kind of cool. I, I do prefer the turquoise to the blue um, uh, in, with uh, um, th that we get in DS9 and Voyager, so... Uh, yeah, maybe they should have uh, sh should have gone with the green. Although I think the reason they wouldn't give somebody a green uniform is because uh, it's really hard to green screen <laughs> with that. Oh, that is act actually true. Yeah, and, and particularly in that scene, like they're obviously like on a green screen. Like it's they're not actually filming outdoors; they're filming on a green screen with the the outdoors projected. So. We have the funeral at the end, but is yeah. there is th is that it? Like, is Tasha ever mentioned again? Do, do is there a lasting impact of her dying? She's a main crew member. She's like a main member of the, you know, the admin crew or whatever you want to call them. You know, the, the senior <laughs> staff. Yes, yeah. uh, her her death is very important to the show. Uh, she doesn't get mentioned again this season, but she is referenced uh in the future um uh you you know Star Trek so you know there is the possibility of like 
time travel or alternate universes Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I I will just say, if you miss Denise Crosby, have hope. I have hope. I live in perpetual hope. But I love Tasha so much. You know that. Tasha and Wesley and Bev are like my three favorites. So they better not kill off Beverly. (laughs) That's all I've got to say. I really didn't like in this episode two or three different times instead of referring to them as crewmates or whatever they called them family like like they're Michael Scott from the office I was like not everybody on the crew was family I thought it was I don't know it felt forced well, it was, I didn't it was, like it it was the funeral scene and it was no, Tasha it wasn't. herself yeah Tasha Tasha <laughs> well, herself oh, did she say it I w- yeah I was thinking about Deanna Deanna calls them family to the sludge monster and oh, she's like, I that's my that. family or, or friends. I can't. She called them friends, not family. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And I was like, they're not your friends, Deanna. They're your crewmates, which is almost even more of an important bond. But it bothered me. It was weird writing because I don't think they've ever referred to the crewmates as friends before. And all of a sudden it's like, those are my friends. You know, more importantly, Deanna, they're your crewmates, you know, and, and then but that happened like twice or three times in the episode. And I was like, this is weird. I've never heard them refer to each other as friends and family before well, but no, tasha it makes sense and tasha uh called deanna her friend in the the uh the racist space africa episode uh oh. so and obviously deanna and uh, uh Riker are friends the you know they've uh they're yeah. in Zadi. um right so i guess we got to talk about that for a second because in the moment where she thinks that Riker is being killed because she can feel like because she felt tasha die or whatever and then she feels Riker in the thing she yells out him zadi right and so well, I mean, he's <laughs> in the sludge when the sludge envelops the uh um the, the shuttlecraft so like he's That's like right, just yeah. right out there of course she can feel him and of course he's in pain because you know he's um right now he's breathing metamucil <laughs> <laughs> so i was really mad about them taking geordie's visor i just thought that was such a playground bully thing to do well but- he, yeah He's a playground bully. He is a playground bully, yeah. So let's talk about the funeral. Okay. Um, so I just watched Endgame last night. <laughs> oh, God. It, you have the exact same scene. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I even read my notes. Oh, this is a Tony Stark funeral. <laughs> I was like having a headache, as you know, because we were going to record yesterday. And so I was just watching comfort movies, which usually ends up being Marvel. And so I watched all of Endgame yesterday and um, it felt like that. It really did, like where we're going through each person. And I was like, but it felt real. And it felt like Tasha had recorded that recently. Um, And I wondered if you knew how often they recorded their death messages. Do they always get a holodeck burial? No, not everyone gets a holodeck burial. Um, and uh, I mean, she's only been on the ship for a year, so it had to have been recorded recently. Oh, uh, okay, that makes sense. That's right, because they all started at the beginning of the season on mm-hmm. the ship. I had yeah. forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I loved. I'm just thinking, it's not at the funeral, but it's at the beginning of the episode that the little character moment between her and Worf, where they're talking about I know the the martial arts thing. Which, by the way, like that scene right there, just is a huge death flag. Like, oh, there's the martial arts tournament next week. Oh, I ever, know. My money's on you. Of course, she's gonna die this episode. I know. <laughs> I was like, anytime they set a character up like that, you know, I was like, oh, guys, you're telegraphing it so hard. <laughs> Uh, her whole funeral took place in a Windows XP background, as, <laughs> as, as you I mentioned. Said, yes. <laughs> I just was like, oh, hey. It's a, but of course, it predates the Windows XP background. So I wondered if this was a chicken or an egg situation. Maybe the guy at Microsoft, which was probably a big nerd just like us, might have been like, you know what? <laughs> well, I think, I, th- I mean, it's a, a real photo. So I think somebody just took that photo and was like, oh, that looks nice. Yeah, it is a real fo- photo. It's called Bliss because I Googled it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the name of the picture is called Bliss. And it was taken in like the early, no, 98. It was taken in 98. So 10 years after this episode. But like, I just, and then they used it. And when did XP come out? Like 2001? 2001, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That sounds about right to me. And I, I I had to look it up because I couldn't remember if it was 98 or XP because it's been so long. As much as 2001 doesn't feel like that long ago, I couldn't remember which one it was. Yeah, I think 98 just had a solid blue background as default. Or like greenish blue, like teal, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. I loved her, like, personal goodbye messages, how she told Worf that she would meet, I, that she hoped she met death with her eyes open or whatever. Like, I yeah. liked all of that stuff. But I really liked what she said to Picard with the, he has the heart of an explorer and the soul of a poet. I was like, that's so sweet. And also she's like, I, I don't know what a father is, but uh, um, so you're the close. I think yeah. you're what a father is, but I wouldn't know. I also liked uh, how she made no mention of that time that she had sex with Data. <laughs> I thought she was going to say something to Data, like, thanks for all the good times, or thanks for being fully functional. I don't know. I was waiting for something. Actually, it didn't come. It's, it, in context, it's kind of a little weird because she talks about how, like, how, how she appreciates Data's, like, naive, childlike quality. And it's like, you mm-hmm. had sex with this man. What? <laughs> Maybe she recorded it before that. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> well, I'm going to miss her. I yeah. did tear. I, I didn't cry, but I had that, like, pricking feeling in your eyeballs, you know? Mm-hmm. And not until the funeral. It took her being all, you know, holographic and saying nice things to people. And then I was like, oh, no, no crying. There's no crying at Star Trek. <laughs> oh, there's 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 crying at Star Trek. You're allowed to cry at Star Trek. <sighs> yeah. I think maybe because I knew it was coming, it wasn't as sad. You know what? I cry, you know, the biggest so you, the biggest cry I ever had in TV ever. Mm-hmm. Do you want to do you want to guess? Do you already know the answer to this? <laughs> <laughs> oh god um i'm guessing it's gonna be something pretty recent um relatively recent yeah well i'm gonna go with mine okay uh, the uh series finale for the good place oh i did cry buckets at that i but cried so many times in that episode i cried so much yeah <laughs> i haven't been able to go back and rewatch season four either because I'm afraid of the emotions it makes me feel uh-huh. but mine that i was gonna bring up was uh Amy and Rory on Doctor Who, <laughs> their final episode. Now, their final episode is kind of cheese ball with the giant yeah. angel, Statue of Liberty angel. That was but dumb. Yeah. They, f- they screwed around with us so much that I thought maybe they were going to get to stay and maybe they had like created some false rumor that they weren't writing, that they were writing Amy and Rory off the show because they get through the whole episode. And then at the end, she's taken, right? Spoilers, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> Um, and then or he's taken and then she follows right yeah. and i just i i couldn't hack it i just i have never cried as much as i cried at that and then it, because it was right at the end of the episode my my partner at the time <laughs> turns it off looks over at me as i'm like unable to breathe crying 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 and he just starts up an episode of dexter which is the next thing on our dvr to watch <laughs> <laughs> Give her a and minute. I'm, and I'm sitting there like, can't breathe crying. And it's that, you know, upbeat Dexter theme is happening. And I'm like, dude, you're going to need to pause that for a minute. <laughs> so maybe I'll get there at some point with Star Trek. But I mean, I it pricked my ears or my eyes. That's for sure. I was There's some like, episodes oh, that I can think of that, that I that think. That might will... make me cry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of an actually uh, Doctor Who related cry for me was. Um, I remember right before I was about to hit play on uh, the end of time part two, which was good uh, lord, I almost brought that one up too. <laughs> yeah, because I um I had legally obtained the 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 video through a completely legitimate method on on uh, New Year's Day because it was of course yeah and, like one does, and I was like, oh, I have finally legally obtained this episode. It's ready to go. And as soon as I was like, oh, it's ready to go, I it just hit me that this was going to be the last time I got to see David Tennant as the Doctor. Mm-hmm. Of course, and he was so you know, good. We, we had the 50th anniversary later, but at that time, this was going to be it. And yeah. I couldn't I couldn't hit play for 10 minutes because I was just sobbing. That 15 minute goodbye where they oh, go God. to each character. The, I don't think I think I started crying at the beginning of the 15 minutes <laughs> and I did not stop until the credits rolled. Yeah, I know. When I really started crying is when Donna is when he said goodbye to Donna. That was me. <laughs> when 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 the doctor's like, I've done it. I'm the Time Lord victorious. And then. Oh, I know. And Wilford. Wil- it was Wilford, Wilford, right? and I was just like, yeah. oh, no. oh, my God, I know. <laughs> oh, man, this is a huge tangent about death. <laughs> huge- but, I mean, I say that David Tennant's regeneration is the best of all of the regenerations, I think, because he really puts his heart and soul into it, you know? Oh, yeah. And then... 
so he puts his heart and soul into it. And you I mean, David Tennant, you, you have to believe everything that's coming out of him as he emotes. And I think the difference here, while we're talking about Amy and Rory and we're talking about the end of time with David Tennant's last episode, is how the death was treated. That's why I think I was so taken aback by Tasha just being unceremoniously killed in the first 10 minutes. Because usually when a major character of a show dies, it's a big deal. Yeah, there is actually another show that had a death very similar to Tasha but i thought in that situation it was a brilliant choice yeah and it was uh terminator the sarah connor chronicles oh i have still not watched that so um i, I won't i won't say what the character who the character is but mm-hmm. their main character and uh there's just a scene where we're just following a terminator going as he's like going to find his target and you know, so like Sarah and everyone, they're like, you know, trying to stop the Terminator and stuff. And this guy just happens to turn the corner right as the Terminator's there and the Terminator shoots him and the camera doesn't even linger on it. The camera's following the Terminator as he keeps going because that guy wasn't even his target. He just got in the way and he just died. And he and was a major character. Like and a he was a character. major char- main character. Uh, and just boom, you just un- unceremoniously killed. Obviously, they spend time at the end of the episode to, you know, mourn his death. But in the moment, it was not even the point of the scene. He just had gotten in the way. Yeah, and that's what it felt like. Like, Tasha was just there. They were like, of these four people that are standing here, who can we kill? I guess it'll be Tasha, you know? Yeah. And she didn't need to die for the episode either. No, there was they no just, need for Tasha to die for that. Other episode. than Denise Crosby wanted to leave the show and they could have written her a better death. Right. And that's the thing about it. I mean, that's the thing about David Tennant, too. And, you know, one of the reasons sometimes I don't have a ton of compassion for him leaving is he wanted to leave. He said, I'm done with Doctor Who. I'm going to go be a t- movie star because yeah. he had gotten a few movies at that point. So whenever anybody does the whole, I don't want to go. And they're like, oh, it's so sad. I'm like, but he did. He really did want to go. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> so like, it's kind of hard to get super, super sad about that for me. But yeah, it's like that. Like you write a major character off. You want a goodbye, you know? Of course, this was a different time in TV, like we've talked about many times. It was 1988. Everything was a little bit more episodic, and I'm not sure people were as attached to characters as we get now. But I wanted more. I definitely wanted more. Though I do love hailing frequencies are closed now, Captain. I thought that was a really good line. Mm -hmm. I liked it a lot. It made me happy. Yeah, that's not a good episode, but the last scene, the funeral, is a good scene. Speaking of not very good episodes, we have We'll Always Have Paris coming up next. Yeah, let's get into that one. (laughs) All right. Next, we're going to talk about We'll Always Have Paris. It is the 24th episode of the first season. It first aired on the 2nd of May, 1988. It was written by Deborah Dean Davis and Hannah Louise Shearer and directed by Robert Becker. So this one uh, is the first time we've seen Picard fencing. It opens with him uh, fencing some other dude on the ship. Yes. Is this a regular thing that he does, fence? We, yeah, we see him fence other times. He actually uh, fences uh, Guinan at some point. Uh, right at the end of the, fen- the fencing match, when they do the, the, the salute bow thing, suddenly time reverses, and then they mm-hmm. do it again. Like a, just a little blip, a little time rubber band. Mm-hmm. And they notice it, and then uh, Picard calls to the bridge. Everyone notices it. Happens to the whole ship. And then they get a uh, distress call from Paul Mannheim. And so they're like, okay. And Picard's like, oh, I know that name. We're going. We're, <laughs> we're going to head there. And uh, turns out Paul Mannheim is like a guy with some uh, wacky theories about uh, uh, time and, uh, you know, its relationship to space and how it's not how, how it's not uh, immutable, how it can be malleable. So they're like, well, obviously he did something. Deanna picks up that there's something more going on. There's a reason that Picard knows who Paul Mannheim is. And uh, as we find out, it's because Paul's wife used to be... His Jean-Luc's girlfriend. Used to be Jean-Luc's girlfriend. (laughs) So a woman that he decided not to end up with because uh, kind of the reason why uh, Riker and Troy aren't together. Uh, Because Picard wanted to be... A Starfleet captain. And as we all know, Starfleet captains can't be married. Ships don't have residential quarters. <laughs> yeah, it's, I know. It's dumb. Um, <laughs> although I I do think that the Enterprise is rather unique in that regard. Like, uh, the Stargazer didn't have families because, like, Jack Crush was on there, but uh, Beverly and, and Wesley weren't. Right. The, I think the Enterprise is large enough that you can fit families, but most ships don't have them. So it, from that perspective, it kind of makes sense. 
that you kind of got to work your way up to getting a post like the Enterprise where you can have your family. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I the very first thing I wrote was looks like a glitch in the Matrix. <laughs> oh, it was. Yeah, it was a deja. Vu. Yeah. One of the characters literally said, "Is it was a deja vu." Yeah, yeah, I know, and I laughed about that too. Um, have you watched the new Matrix? I did. I saw it twice. Once when I was tired and drunk, and so like I was like, "Okay, I don't." Was that the last half of that movie, a Fever Dream? So then I went back and watched it sober. And I, I really watched liked it. it sober, and maybe I need to watch it a second time because I felt I don't know. Anyway, I wanted to like it really bad because I'm one of the people that likes Matrix Two and Three, and uh-huh. I really wanted to like it. And that would be a whole other pop- podcast episode. I was just curious if you had seen it yet. It's a whole. It's a. It's interesting. It's an interesting take. I think on their uh-huh. own series, you know. Yeah, it's definitely um, not the movie that the studio wanted them to make. It's definitely the movie that Lana made. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, you're going to make me make this movie? Not only am I going to say they made me make this movie in the movie, <laughs> I'm, just, yeah, I'm, the I'm going time. to subvert everything. Yeah. So Data's basically Alexa, I realized this episode, because someone says, I've never heard of Paul Mandheim, and Jean-Luc goes, Data? And he just like, starts... <laughs> It's, it's like when I say, oh, I can't say it because she's sitting right there. It's like when I say her name and then all of a sudden she starts telling me what I wanted to hear. I I thought that was funny that he's basically Alexa for the ship. <laughs> the whole like time thing turns out it's actually kind of the B plot. Like the main point of the story is that Picard uh, is meeting an old flame and, and uh, mm-hmm. why he, he left her at that cafe in Paris all those years ago. Where they all speak English in French accents. Yeah, and the, the maitre <laughs> d', was it just me or did the maitre d' look to you like a, um, a, a discount check off? Oh, yeah, now that you mention it. <laughs> it was just like, wait, did, did they get Walter Koenig to do like a different role? No, that's not him. <laughs> Hey, you've so done a de- Russian accent. Can you do a French one? Can you do French? Yeah. So Deanna comes up to him and he's and basically her head's exploding because she can feel all of his emotions towards this name and these people or whatever. And, and yeah. he's like, what do you suggest? And I wrote in all caps, therapy. I suggest <laughs> therapy. I said, baby, you could talk about hating kids or killing Wesley's dad or I don't know, Tasha Yar dying. <laughs> <laughs> but what she instead recommends is he spend some time with his thoughts. Like, how about, <laughs> hey, can we, can you come to my office real quick? Let's have a session. <laughs> no, no, I don't need therapy. I need fake Paris. <laughs> like, okay, okay, Sean Luke. And also, like, the holodeck even, like, knew why he was there, because they even had, like, characters there. Like, there was a, a woman on, on the holodeck, a holodeck character who was like, I can't believe he stood me up. And it was just like, uh, I know. like how, how did the holodeck know? Because <laughs> <laughs> he's done this a million times before. <laughs> I don't know. Also, so you know how I like to complain about them using near past references to 1988? After uh-huh. I saw them trying to do music in a more modern setting and it was a man stroking a couple of bongs i was like okay maybe i prefer them referencing near music or whatever because <laughs> that, <laughs> that thing he's holding like he's got like that cigarette case holder thing like the girls in the old-fashioned casinos but it's like yeah. long cylindrical tubes that look like bongs and he's like stroking them <laughs> to me. i don't know it was bad whatever it was what i want to know is who approved that gigantic pipe running directly under the Eiffel Tower? Did you notice that? <laughs> no, there is like a huge pipe running under the Eiffel Tower. And I'm just like, there is zero chance the anybody like in the French, French municipality would allow you to modify the Eiffel Tower. What was in that the way. pipe supposed to be? Like- I don't know. Maybe it was like uh, maybe Elon Musk bought France or uh, at some point and built his Hyperloop there. <laughs> Um, I think this episode, while he's in there in Paris and like having this reminiscence before the people are on board, really highlights how Minuet should have been written for Picard and not Riker. <laughs> Just yeah. as a side note, <laughs> uh-huh. because to me, I was like, you know, Minuet is French. Minuet is like all these things like it really it, it's still it's still bothering me episodes later that Minuet was supposedly written for Riker and not Jean-Luc. Mm hmm. They get to the thing and uh, beam up Paul and I don't even remember the name of his wife. The, she it was, was like Janelle J- J- Janice. Janice. Yes, yeah. that's what it was. And apparently he, she's fine because like anytime they were doing time experiments, they had her go in like a lead lined room or something like that. Smart. But he's like smart. Yeah. <laughs> 
but he's like dying from a you know the all the the the, the time experiments that they've been doing and um i noticed that uh um and then like at, at some point uh janice uh kisses picard on the cheek and beverly sees it uh-huh and then Picard quickly feels the need to explain it to her, and I'm just like, yeah, of course you do. You you really do need to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time that we actually acknowledge that uh, Bev has feelings for Jean-Luc, though. Because Deanna goes up to her and is like, you're having a hard time or whatever. It's not the first time that we've acknowledged it, because she did, you know, like, zip her her, her jumpsuit down in uh, The Naked Now, but uh, yeah. it's the first time sober that she's acknowledged it, and to somebody else. Yeah, um, to somebody else is probably what I, what I was, what I meant, yeah. Although I don't know whether it had been something that Bev had ever confided in Troy, like, in a, in a counseling session, or if it's just something Troy could pick up on because she's an I think an Troy picked up on it, yeah. I think she could feel it, and I think it was, like, I, one of my notes here, let me see, oh yeah, Deanna's head must be exploding somewhere where while John Luke Picard is trying to be this chill because he was trying to be super chill with the girl in the room that he had stood up in France but I was like this must be very hard on Deanna <laughs> like, to have to feel all these emotions that everybody's trying to like push down you know <laughs> I, I gotta say though I do like all of the uh, the little time perturbations that we saw in the episode, like when they mm-hmm. walk onto the uh, turbo lift and then the turbo lift doors open and then they see themselves about to walk onto the I turbo lift. I like that one a lot too, yeah. And, and then they're, they're just like, wait, which one of us is the real one? They're like, I, I think we're both real ones. And then like the turbo lift closes and you would think that you would just go with the people on the turbo lift because we had already seen them go on. But no, then the camera just sticks with the people who haven't gone on the turbo lift yet. And then they're yeah. like, okay, well, I guess we'll wait for the next one. And... Uh, <laughs> It was that was a great moment because it, it, it was really gave you the timey wimeyness of the episode. It sure did, yeah. I and I mean, it really it was a good way to show it. I'm a sucker for time travel, like I love time travel stuff. So when I was watch- when we had that first one at the beginning when he's fencing, I was like, ooh, this could be cool. You know, of course, I thought it was a holodeck misfunction. I thought he was in the holodeck at first, and it was yeah. like a malfunction of the holodeck, but. And obviously it wasn't because he calls the deck and they're like, yeah, it happened here too. Yeah, because especially when they had that, that that trail with their arms moving, I was like, oh, that's weird. That must have been a holodeck thing. And they're like, oh, nope, it was a time thing. Can people get lost when they're being tra- transported, teleported? So, like, let's say that I am teleporting you to my ship. Mm-hmm. And as you're being beamed over, something happens to my teleporter. Are they just lost forever if they're like in between phasing in and out between the two? Uh, yeah, sometimes you just are just gone. You just die. Sometimes your pattern might be scattered around in a nebula and like then. But like then the John can- Luke episode where they. Yeah. Where he went out into that cloud or whatever. There's an episode of Enterprise where uh, the inventor of the teleporter actually manages, like, apparently his son had, like, been lost in a transporter accident, like, decades before, but he was able to find his pattern in, like, a nebula and rematerialize it, but then he rematerialized dead anyway. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. So it's kind of inconsistent. It doesn't really make sense from my perspective that, like, like, the transporter just kind of kills you it doesn't really make sense that there would be an essence to your atoms that would retain themselves once they're broken apart you're just atoms so it really is just breaking you down and then building you back up again so if you lose that signal it should just be gone um if the the transport buffer you know the pattern buffer itself that that is the blueprint of you so if you don't get that then you don't get you okay that makes sense i because there was something in Maybe it was symbiosis where things were getting like half beamed up and not yeah. getting all the way beamed up. And I started, and then something in this episode made me think about it again, where I was like, yeah, can people just be lost in the teleportation process? You yep. know? Actually, um, I think the first transporter accident, well, there have been transporter accidents uh, all over in Star Trek. Um, there was one, I mean, uh, the original series had one that split Kirk into a good half and an evil half. There was one transporter accident that sent them to the mirror universe. But I mm-hmm. think the first transporter malfunction where, like, they just beamed up wrong was uh-huh. in the movie where, like, uh, uh, like two members of the Enterprise were going to be beamed up, but the malfunction happened. And then, like, we don't see it, but, like, uh, it was beamed up so wrong, like, you hear the transporter chief go, whatever came back didn't live long, fortunately. Oh, <laughs> yeah. like one of the original series cast movies? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, okay. the first one, the the, the motion picture. With V'ger, yeah. Okay. Because that sounds familiar as you were saying it, and that's maybe why I... Because as we all know, I've seen the movies. I just... um long time ago, so that's probably why I thought there was a way you could die while you were taking the teleporter. Why does Paul Mannheim sound like a name I should know? Was You think it was just completely main, made up? Because I kept thinking it was a name I should know. Um, Well, Mannheim, for me, I just think of Mannheim Steamroller, the... Uh, <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, um... <laughs> that was what I was thinking the whole time. Like, Mannheim, I'm like, oh, are we about to get uh, synth Christmas music? <laughs> I, I just, I didn't think much of this episode. I was a little confused at the end that that lady would never heard a holodeck when he took her on the holodeck. <laughs> I just, it was just kind of a messy, boring episode. The, the way that the holodeck has been presented, um, even though it's kind of retconned later in Star Trek, but the way it was presented is that it's pretty new technology like it, most ships don't have it like the enterprise is one of the first ships to have it because remember picard's geeking out over it uh, right just doing doing his hollow novel and um they kind of later just act like oh, no it's technology has always been there and there was the rec room in the animated series which was a hundred years before which was a, a rudimentary holodeck so they've had the technology for a while and were there holodecks in the original series i don't remember there being no gene roddenberry okay. wanted to do it but it was cost prohibitive at the time that's why it was first introduced in the animated series because i see you can just draw things but uh yeah I think, but because it's a new thing and because, like, they had gone off 15 years beforehand, it was just technology that she missed. Okay, that makes sense. I like the moment where uh, Data is going to repair, like, the the, the time tear or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then, like, he splits into three. And Mm -hmm. then he's just like, which one of us is the real one? And the one in the middle goes, me, I'm the real one. And I'm just like... There's probably an explanation in Data's head for how he was able to discern that. But all I can see is, oh, I'm the middle one, so it's obviously me. And <laughs> that would have been really funny if one of the other Data goes, no, it's me! And like, yeah. they fight each other over it. That could be a whole episode in and of itself. Data gets split into three, and which one's the real Data? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, overall, it was just an episode. Oh, I did think it was funny when, like, it was just uh, Paul Mannheim and his wife, and they were, like, Riker's trying to explain how to, like, beam them up or something and he's like having to walk her through how to do it i was like oh this feels like every it support call i've ever had to do no it was uh <laughs> turning off the force field and oh, yeah, turning off the force field that's she's what like was, okay yeah. i'll see if i can do it and I, yeah i was just sitting there just like i've been on this call i've been on this call she's not gonna turn off the force field she's gonna turn <laughs> off she's gonna mess up the intermix chamber on their their antimatter reactor and it's gonna blow up <laughs> she doesn't know what she's doing because she's literally just there's his wife she's not a scientist it would have right it would have made more sense if she had been a scientist or something but what, what was she doing there like, I mean, being a wife, she, just being a wife, but like, this is the future. <laughs> w- wives can do things. <laughs> yeah. Wives can do things. I don't know. The, her whole character was weird. They just wanted to give us some like, ooh, Jean-Luc used to be a person in the real days, mm-hmm. you know, and they also wanted to give us, a, they gave us that moment of jealousy in that moment between Deanna and Bev where they were able to talk about the relationship too. So that's what it gave us. But like, I don't know. I, especially after following up Tasha's death, I was like, yeah. this episode is so Meh. bleh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can't believe we're at the end of season one. Next episode, we're going to talk about the last two episodes of the season. And we're yeah. already at the end of season one. <laughs> like, yeah, it's crazy. I'm getting excited for that. I know. I'm pretty excited to see where it goes. Because, you know, season two, I hear, is where it really starts to take off. And at this point, I'm already invested in the characters. And I'm probably more invested because I do have to watch them with the critical like what am i gonna say about this but Mm -hmm. i think i i mean the whole i find myself not wanting to watch star trek now the next generation like on my own just to watch it and not because i have to because of the podcast or whatever and i have to keep stopping myself because i want to be i want it to be fresh for the podcast well if you want to watch star trek because we're probably not gonna go do like an episode by episode review of prodigy just go watch that that's true i do have prodigy it's new star trek and it is a great introduction to star trek so i do think we should do picard after we do 
next generation though i think we've talked about doing that so Mm -hmm. i probably won't watch i have watched season one of picard but i was only half watching it i was doing other stuff while it was on the tv but i mean i think it'll be great once i know all the characters i think i'm going to really love the show because i kind of sort of liked it without even knowing the characters but now i want to go back and watch it knowing the characters you Mm -hmm. know and you are you already watched voyager so seven of nine is like really the only non-tng character that's relevant and you know yeah so and I don't remember every detail about Voyager, but I did basically watch every episode while it was there on the TV and I was in the room, I suppose. I didn't pay too much attention to it. Somebody else was watching it. But mm-hmm. it was there and I watched, I mean, I had to watch a lot of it because it was on. Right. Um. But uh, overall, I mean, the episode was kind of boring, but I guess it was kind of a nice plat- palate cleanser after Skin of Evil because I was still kind of like irritated that she was dead. And then once I watched We'll Always Have Paris, I was like, okay, we're moving on into star trek you know there will be no more tasha going forward (laughs) so in that way it was kind of good well i think that's it for today thanks for joining us i'm ari and i'm gay fesh and until next time live long and prosper thank you for listening you can find more episodes on apple spotify and wherever you get your podcasts we're on twitter at rest both worlds join our patreon at patreon.com slash rest of both worlds for bonus content and hear your name at the end of each episode